just before Great Mall Parkway at Tasman Drive, past the scene of the crash. Emergency crews still waiting on a tow truck to clear one of the vehicles involved because it suffered some major front end damage. Looking in at the tail end of the uh, trouble through the Santa Cruz Mountains, Highway 17 northbound. Still going to jam up for you just before Highway 9, continuing into Los Gatos until just before Highway 85. So this is getting lighter and lighter. That'll continue over the course of the next half an hour. You next look the roads later on this hour here on the Traffic Leader, KCBS. Our forecast for the Bay Area, we've got some clear skies tonight. Uh, clouds along the coast, though, with lows in the 60s and 60s. Should be a sunny one tomorrow, 60s and 70s coast high. But for upper 70s, the middle 80s around the Bay and inland highs with range, range from the low 80s to the mid 90s. Traffic and weather together on KCBS. Proven quality sleep is life-changing sleep. Cartel 
really explains this. Um, and what it really gets to is that most people think of the Sacklers and Purdue Pharma when they think about the opioid epidemic. They don't think of companies like Walmart or Walgreens. But what Scott and I found in uh, more than a two-year investigation is that while Purdue Pharma and the Sacklers may have ignited this crisis, a lot of these other companies that Americans know pretty well, like Walgreens, Walmart, really fuels the deadliest drug epidemic in American history. And there are some companies that are part of this American cartel, according to the DEA, that people have never heard of, uh, may never heard of, like Malincroft, a company based in St. Louis, that actually manufactured 30 times the number of pain pills that the Sacklers uh, produce farm. And together, these companies um, form what the Drug Enforcement Administration uh, once called an American cartel. Yeah, yeah, so it really is this sprawling network of companies and interests that came together to really protect this supply, keep it flowing year after year, even as the alarm bells were ringing. But for anybody who has not been following the opioid crisis closely, let's make sure that we set the table a little bit and uh, Paige, uh, Scott Hyam, remind us how did the opioid crisis begin? Uh, obviously, uh, we mentioned Purdue Pharma. There was a uh, role we played there. Uh, what, what, what tipped this off, and then how did this grow in its scope uh, so dramatically? Well, it, it, you can trace it back to 1996 when a, a drug uh, called OxyContin went on the market, and uh, that was the brainchild of the Sacklers and Purdue Pharma. And um, basically what OxyContin is is oxycodone. Uh, that is time release. Um, and this was supposed to be like a miracle drug, and it was time release, we couldn't get addicted to it, and they convinced the entire medical community and doctors that it was safe to prescribe this drug, when now internal documents show that that's not true. It was a highly addictive drug that a lot of people got uh, hooked on, on this drug. You could crush it um, and defeat the time release uh, function on on these tablets. You could snort it, you could shoot it, you could get uh, a huge dose of oxycodone very quickly, and it's like the equivalent of a bit of heroin. And so, for about 10 years, oxycodone was on 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 the market, ruled the market. About 2006, um, when Purdue Pharma was fined uh, 600 more than 600 million dollars for misbranding its drug. They had to reformulate it. And at that point, a lot of other companies saw that there was a huge market and a lot of money to be made, and they jumped in with both feet. Uh, Sari mentioned uh, Malincrot, uh, their, their pill, it was a little blue 30 milligram tablet that had an M on one side and a 30 on the other, and that pill became the most popular pain pill uh, on the streets. And a, a bunch of other companies uh, you know, joined the fray. And so, like Sarah said, many of them, you are household names, but many of them, most Americans have never heard of. There's you know, Activist, which is a big manufacturer of car pharmaceuticals. And so what our book does, it, it really begins in that time frame. I mean, it, Purdue set the table for this American right now in our how much some people knew 
early on, you talk about the DEA, we did have mountains of information about where these pills were going. Just so many more pills to these little towns that couldn't possibly have used them in a legitimate way. And questions were raised early on, Sari Horowitz, and yet didn't lead to the sort of outcome that we might expect. No, I mean, when you talk about numbers, Keith, these, uh, these companies, manufacturers, distributors, um, sent a shocking hundred billion highly addictive and dangerous pain pills across the country. Um, in fact, the DEA agents called these executives and these companies drug dealers in business. Um, you know, just to pick up on, on what Scott was saying about Joe Renazzini, so the way that the, the, the nar that narcotics are manufactured and distributed in this, this country, it's a closed system. It's unlike other drugs. In 1970, Congress realized that these were such addictive drugs. They created this system that was very controlled and regulated so that drugs would not leak out or be diverted to the black market. And Joe Benavizzi, who Scott talked about, was in charge of the diversion unit in the DEA. And he saw that the companies, especially the distributors, the middlemen, so there's manufacturers, they make the drugs, distributors distribute, and then there's the pharmacies. The distributors were, 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 were skirting the law, breaking the law, because when pharmacies order a, a suspiciously large amount of drugs or something that does this out of their routine, the distributors are supposed to stop Find out why the pharmacies are ordering so much, the red flag, stop shipping them, and tell the Drug Enforcement Administration. They didn't do that. And so Joe Renazzisi warned them. First, he wrote the letters, met with them, they ignored them. They ignored the Drug Enforcement they, so they ignored the government, basically. And so finally, Joe and his team started shutting down warehouses and forcing these companies to pay millions of dollars in fines. For example, Walgreens was forced to pay $80 million. And the companies all said, okay, we're going we're to be better. We're going to try to control this better. But shockingly, they went and did it again. And again, the Drug Enforcement Administration and Jim Green Divinity went after them and fined them. Why did the Drug Enforcement Administration decide to fight back? They, they fought first in the courtroom, in the courthouse, and then when they lost, they And they were armed with high paid lobbyists and Washington lawyers campaign contributions, and they were actually, it was amazing, but they were actually at the height of the opioid epidemic able to get a law passed that kneecapped the Drug Enforcement Administration, weakened the ability of the DEA to come after them, stop the carnage. And then as Scott said, personally, they went after Joe personally, crushed him and his team, forced him out of government, basically. All about money. They are ignoring the epidemic they're making billions of dollars. All right, and we're going to pick up on some of those ideas in just a second. Uh, real quick for anybody who's just joining us, this is KCBS In Depth, your weekly deep dive into the events and trends shaping life in the Bay Area and beyond. I'm Keith Benconi. Today, we're looking at the complex legal dealings and high-powered politics that helped keep the supply of pain pills flowing even as the opioid crisis was gathering force. Hearing about it from Barry Horowitz and Scott Hyam, both Pulitzer Prize-winning journalists for the Washington Post, and their new book is American Cartel, Inside the Battle to Bring Down the Opioid Industry. So, just to maybe complete the picture for uh, our listeners out there, God, I am, where were these pills ending up? Uh, we were talking about the fact that many more pills were landing in these cities than could really be absorbed, so what was actually happening to these pills? Well, you know, all roads led to Florida at the very beginning of, 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 of this epidemic. Um, there was a lot of pill mills. Florida is kind of a wild west uh, state when it comes to regulation. And so there were a lot of corrupt doctors and there were a lot of uh, storefront operations where you could just walk in and say you have back pain and you would pay a doctor 250 bucks and $400 and you get oxycodone and then you walk down the street to another doctor. And so people started collecting all these scripts and then they would they would go back home uh, and, and or they would stop at uh, a Walgreens or a CVS on the, on the way home uh, to you know Ohio or West Virginia, which where it was kind of the original grand zero of the opioid epidemic. There was 
with your pair of CBS stores, and this is in our book, um, uh, it's kind of an amazing 